This is Talk Business and Politics with Roby Brock. Welcome to the program. Joining me now, John Brummett, columnist with the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Good to see you this morning, sir. And you're looking mighty sharp today. You've got a suit on, nice tie, and very well dressed. Well, when you're going to get on uh, a telecast, a video cast with Roby Brock, you've got to step up your game. <laughs> this tie, by the way, you mentioned I might mention it, so I will. Okay. Uh, neighbor. <laughs> A neighbor went to a state sale at the uh, garden home of uh, uh, Dale, Pump, Dale Bumpers after his passing, and he showed up at my house and he said, I bought you something, and this was one of the senator's ties, and he said, I think that's the one he wore when he was defending Clinton on impeachment. Uh, Bumpers' children quickly told me that this is not that tie, but, you know, it's, uh, it's got a little Arkansas history here. Right. Very conservative, appropriate uh, political tie, wouldn't you think? Much like what you wear daily, right? <laughs> well, let's channel your inner Dale bumpers and talk about the State of the Union address uh, that was yes. past week. President Joe Biden kind of laying out what he felt was the State of the Union. I think we saw the typical hyperpartisan reactions to everything. Did you hear anything in the State of the Union speech that you thought was on point? Uh, not so much, not, not so much. And uh, I, I don't mean that terribly uh, critically of Biden, this particular speech. States of the Union are, are pageantry, uh, partisan uh, contrivance. And, and every year we, we assign, and I did it this year, we assign such great significance to these moments of prime time address by the president that he faces all manner of, uh, of difficulty and challenge. And it is so important what words he says and how he says them. And then within three or four days, we've forgotten it. I, uh, uh, I mean, it was okay. It was, it started strong, uh, with the parts that were new necessarily about Ukraine, even though he didn't tell us anything specific, he attempted to, uh, to, uh, be certain and confident and credible and to uh, soothe, it will all be okay, he says, it will all be okay. Uh, and that was fine. And after that, it broke down into the litany of, of things he had to cover. And you had the uh, jack-in-the-box Democrats up and down and the, and the Republicans not so happy. And uh, then afterward, I remember nothing. All I remember about State of the Union addresses uh, is that Bill Clinton once declared that the era of big government is over. He had just lost big in the midterms. Actually, the era of big government turned out not to be over. And then I think it was a State of the Union, unless it was a special wartime address in which George W. said, uh, introduced the axis of evil, Iran, North Korea, and somebody. And uh, I mean, really, I mean, and, and that, that amounted only to misbegotten war and, and, and uh, mass weapons of mass destruction, Iraq because they had weapons of mass destruction, which we couldn't find. So, you know, we came, he came, he spoke, he got through it, he stumbled only a time or two. Uh, the Democrats say great speech, the Republicans say what nonsense, and we go on to uh, do our politics as we do it for another day. Should we quit doing State of the Union yes. speeches? Yes. I didn't mean to preempt your question, but uh, yes, yes. Uh, the Constitution doesn't require a, a primetime television spectacle. The Constitution requires a report by the President of the State of the Union, a very thoughtful, understated, fact-based report uh, uh, that we all could go read online uh, would be perfectly acceptable, in my view. And we save these sorts of things for big moments. If we got something the President needs to say to Congress that we all need to hear in prime time, then let's do that. But but this is just a, this is just a show and and honestly, uh, uh, yeah, they're not memorable. They don't have any effect. Uh, and uh, yet, I bet next year, I bet next year I'll be on here the week before the uh, State of the Union talking about uh, it's a, it's a big moment for Biden. I bet I'll forget all this and say that, and everybody will be nodding. So it's just what we do. Filing period has ended in Arkansas, so candidates for political office are pretty well known. Did you see anything in the filing? What, what's going to be the most watched or 
a couple of the most watched races for you to get some sort of temperature on Arkansas politics? Up there's a pretty good front page piece in the Democratic Gazette yesterday. There are more contests in the, in the primaries than in the general election. And nearly all the contests in the primaries, of course, are Republican. Uh, there are a few few places where Democrats are having uh, primaries. That's in, in terms of the legislature. I'm, talk, I'm watching re Republican infighting in the legislature. I will tell you that I've had occasion to have conversations over the recent weeks with state senator, Republican state senators, and the way they talk about each other and the spitefulness about this, about their personal conflicts and the, and the, and the reasonable conservatives versus the less reasonable versus the totally unreasonable. That's what I'm watching. And whether, and whether uh, uh, the, the temperament of the Senate uh, can change and whether the, the Republicanism will move more to a conventional perfectly fine conservatism and away from this <clears throat> Trumpy uh, resentment based uh, conservatism. And there are four or five races out there on the Republican side in the Senate that will show that. Uh, and, and I'll be watching those. <clears throat> I'm also truly fascinated. I, have, I wasn't for a while, but now I am. Uh, what I thought to be the most popular Republican in Arkansas, the mild mannered, perfectly inoffensive uh, John Bozeman. Remember when he ran the first time when the Senate vacancy opened and he had like seven or eight opponents and he beat them all without a runoff. And it, uh, it, it showed me this guy is stout in the Republican Party. He is beloved. We'll find out if he still is and find out how, how much uh, uh, Republican relations uh, have deteriorated since then because I'm, I'm interested in this, in this Beckett, this football star. Who's, who's got a pack that's spending money and going to continue, I guess, to spend money, uh, reminding everyone that he's a conservative warrior, a Christian, a Razorback, and anything else that might hurt him in a, a politically in a Republican primary, and calling a, a Bozeman a, a Republican in name only. While he's got Trump's endorsement, which Sarah Sanders probably got for him, uh, suddenly I'm interested in that. Most likely, Bozeman will proceed to an impressive renomination. But the trip there... To, uh, is going to be something I'll be keeping my eye on. What about you? Anything well, else? The lieutenant governor's race interests me. I'm curious to see again because you've got all those splintered factions of Republicanism right. uh, in there. And then there's a couple of key legislative races where you've got some interesting matchups, particularly the Bob Ballinger right. that he's got with, you know, I think there's four primary opponents for him of Again, varying dimensions of republicanism. That one will be one. I suspect it goes runoff, but who knows? So uh, we'll right. watch that to see. I, I think there are eight. <clears throat> there are eight. I think maybe seven. Eight uh, Republican incumbent senators running again who face primary opposition. Four of them: uh, Ballinger, Beckham, Stubblefield, and uh, one other. Uh, excuse me at the moment. Strike me as <clears throat> rather extreme conservatives opposed by someone less extreme. Then you've got uh, Sturch, who's sort of a less extreme Republican, opposed by House Member Payton, who's more conservative. Uh, and then there are three others that I, are sort of nondescript that I don't understand. But that's a lot of action. And then you've got how many senators who are just leaving by term limits or seeking other office? Seven more or something? Uh, yeah. So, uh, so you know. Uh, uh, and one guy's running, uh, uh, oh, and Mark Johnson was one I mentioned, who I think is of a more extreme conservatism, who has a Republican opponent, largely, I think, because of redistricting. So it's, this with redistricting is complicated. People aren't where they used to be necessarily in the same. Uh, and, and this and the House may have some interesting things. But frankly, I obsess on the Senate because it's it's smaller and easier to watch, you know. And so plus there's there's it's, it's just been an extraordinary uh, uh, snake pit. Uh, in recent uh, months, years. Well, you talked about some of the dysfunction in the state Senate and how they uh, talk about each other. It does happen in the House as well. Somebody has told me that they spend about $30,000 a day during a regular or fiscal session just on operations, that that, that $30,000 could be spent much more effectively if they just hired a therapist to help all of them. <laughs> their, their psychological and team building issues there. So but something to keep in mind. Yeah. I would, I would support that. Being, being a tax and spend liberal, I would support spending maybe, that money maybe, for that. Maybe we can get a citizen's initiative going for something like that. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, lastly, uh, and this kind of plays into that, we the fiscal session coming to an end supposedly on Tuesday. Uh, there was a bunch of rigmarole over the funding of Arkansas PBS, the public television station. In the end, its budget passes after all of the sound and fury. Explain to people why you knew this was inevitably going to happen, but we had to go through that dog and pony show for a few weeks. It's inevitably going to happen because the game is uh, very conservative, uh, extreme conservative Republicans in the legislature, just a few in this case, uh, persuaded some enough of their colleagues, uh, we need to send a message to this channel, or this AETN, uh, they just hired a liberal to do some education programming and sell that stuff on there. Big Bird sounds a little more liberal than he used to. And we need to send a message that we're in charge now, and they've got to deal with us, and they've got to reflect our values. I remember Frank White was governor sending a letter to the governor's school saying, I want you to stop having having all these instructors and, and, and reflect my values, which was an uproar at the time. It's less so now because we have devolved in our political thinking. But that's what it was about. It was most likely, almost assuredly, eventually going to pass with either an interim study of, which we didn't get, of AETN, uh, or this sort of admonishment. Here's your money one more time, but we've made it clear to you we're watching you. Now, what does that mean? I think it means sitting up there at, uh, at AETN, they've got to think hard about uh, every frontline documentary, every American experience show. Uh, who they got on Austin City Limits? Is he liable to say something? I mean, I think I think it's, 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 a, it's a hamstringing or an onerous cloud hanging over the people trying to run public television. And it's deeply unfortunate. Uh, I would have preferred, this is gonna sound outrageous, but I almost would prefer they just let it go dark and let us live with that kind of thinking and see how we like it, you know? But uh, that, of course, was never going to happen. So we've got, we've got a people running our public television operation here in Arkansas. We've got to deal with the fact that we better, we better do more screening and pondering some of what we're putting on the air because we have heard the word. That's what I think it means. And it's not good. All right. And that is the last word for this episode of Talk Business and Politics with John Brummett, columnist with the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Thank you, sir. Roby, I'll see you next week. Lord willing. Thank you.